Hi, welcome. This is Cambridge House Live. My name is Jonathan Roth. I'm joined now by Josh Brown. He's from the reformedbroker.com and is the author of Backstage Wall Street. Josh, thanks a lot for joining me. Thank you for having me. Listen, the world, uh, you come from the epicenter of the financial world, New York City, and uh, what's happening in New York and happening in financial centers all over the world right now is a bit disconcerting for investors especially. Yeah. What's your take on what's going on? I think what we're witnessing is a, a repricing of, of risk and almost a, a rejiggering of expectations of what's going to go on with global growth. You're starting to see GDP estimates cut at all the large firms, starting to see uh, a little bit of an awareness that what the events of Europe, the events in China are getting a little bit out of control. And so that's kind of taking its toll on what we consider to be stronger markets like Germany and the US. So that's a process. It's not pretty. We don't know exactly when it ends, but it's one of the better telegraphed slowdowns in recent memory. All the signs have been there since February, March, April. So the fact that most of the market is just waking up to it in May and now in June is a little bit tragic. It means a lot of people aren't paying attention. Hmm. So where do you think this is going to go? In terms of what? Yeah, Price well, of in, the ter indices in terms of what's going on with the market, you know, we got a long way down to go. Obviously, there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle here tied together. But I, I wish I had an answer to that. I really don't have a strong opinion. One yeah. of the things that we try to do at our shop, we're a tactical asset manager. Mm -hmm. We're a little bit less focused on trying to pick the right stock, a little bit more focused on watching the macro data, uh, market internals, momentum, et cetera, and determining when we want to be heavily invested and when we want to be lightly invested. Fortunately, the things that we saw this spring got us most of the most of the way uh, away from the carnage. Um, we've got very light stock allocations, and you know I think part of that is an admission that we really don't know how far this goes. Uh, but we know that it's not worth what the upside could be to risk what the downside could be. Are you guys heavily into gold? Heavily into gold? We're not. We've got a weighting toward gold as part of our mix, but we're not necessarily heavily weighted toward gold. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an area that obviously we don't want to ignore, right. but it's not something we have an edge on. In fact, we look at gold technically more than anything else because we don't think that there's a fundamental way to value it. Um, but that's worked out for us over the years, so it's mm -hmm. fine. Hmm. Okay, I want to touch on your book. We're going to get to that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about a couple of stories that have been really big in the news here over the last couple of weeks. The Facebook IPO was a debacle of gigantic I thought it worked out well. What, well it worked out well for some people, not for everyone. Yeah. What, what's the story there? You know, it's hard to place blame on any one person in particular. Mm -hmm. I think Morgan Stanley, the lead underwriter, gets a bad rap that they somehow screwed their investors or... You know, you have to look at it from their standpoint. They're the banker, and their job is to maximize upside for the company. That's their responsibility here. And we have these, this relatively new thing, this gray market, the second market, where basically the company already came public before it came public. It's being valued at $90 billion in the private market. How does Morgan Stanley say to Facebook, hey, you know what, you're really only worth 60 you almost can't do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this is all to be pinned on the underwriters. I think if anything, Facebook probably came public six months too late. LinkedIn too kind late. of, yeah, LinkedIn hmm. did this exactly right. Mm -hmm. It came public last year in a better market, a better economy, and there was a lot more fervor for social media. And as a result, their stock price performed much better. Facebook kind of came on a little bit too late. Valuations had gotten too lofty, and, and that's what ends up happening toward the end of a, a, a mania, so to speak and now Facebook actually has to trade on fundamentals as opposed to momentum, which is not good. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's definitely it's more not good. More fun to trade on momentum. Yeah, for sure. Right. Now, over to JP Morgan, they yeah. say they've lost at least $2 billion. Yeah, that's, that a, number, that's a black box wrapped in, a, in, a, in another black box. Yeah, like who right. knows where that number is gonna go to? What, what's the story there, what are you it's hearing? tough, we were in JP Morgan. Um, we, we got long, the company announced a buyback, a huge dividend increase, it was phenomenal. And then this kind of blindsided us. When the news broke, we took most of our position off the table. Hmm. We've got a very, very small amount here. Um, the stock is trading at six months low, uh, six month lows. It looks terrible. We're certainly not looking to, uh, at, you know, be averaging down or anything like that because we think that the stock is cheap. But again, there could be another shoe to drop and a shoe after that. So hmm. we're interested to hear what Jamie Dimon says in front of Congress next week, mm -hmm. and you know, we'll, we'll we'll see what happens at that point. But it's certainly not a good situation. Yeah. Now let's move over to your book, Backstage Wall Street. You've yeah. been surprised by the reaction to this thing because you've gotten a lot of, I, I think, really positive press because you really, you blew, you've blew you blown the doors off uh, of uh, an industry that not a lot of people know how. You know, how when it I works. was when I was writing it, I kind of thought that that would happen. I mean, 
Clearly. Yeah. I write a you, lot. You interested a publisher, so somebody yeah. knew you had a story. I, I write a lot, I blog a lot. And when you do a blog post, you really have no idea what the reaction is going to be. This one I knew was going to be controversial mm -hmm. because I'm saying things that no one in the industry has ever said mm -hmm. in public, in print, whatever the case may be. But I think uh, the, the, the truthfulness of it really took people by surprise and it's kind of taking on a life of its own. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, I bet it is. Now, the traditional broker model, you say, is broken beyond repair. Yes. Why? Walk me through it, that. It's, well, it's not just that it's broken, it's also outlived its usefulness. In, in this day and age where execution of a trade is a commodity, really all you have to offer is expertise. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about the statistics of stock picking, um, you know, open end mutual fund track records versus the benchmark, products and the and the insidious hidden costs. If you know anything about that, then you know that there really is no value add of somebody calling you to sell you something. Mm -hmm. um, so I think most of the industry is going toward the advisory side and it's it's an ugly process. There are layoffs everywhere, regulatory actions being taken, a lot of denial. Uh, but I think in my book what I try to bring out is, look, this is not anything that anyone can help. It's the result of technology, the public waking up, demographics, et cetera, mm -hmm. the best thing to do is just embrace the change. Right, okay. So who, who like, let's just, we know, obviously I, I want to get to where the future, where, where we're going to go in the future, but right now, who does the broker really work for? Because you're saying the broker is not working for the client. Historically, the broker was working for three masters, the client, the firm, and himself. Mm -hmm. And that was okay. You know, it, it made sense in its time, but with the advent of, of, of all these technologies that allow you to be more efficient, with the advent of ETFs that allow you to get stock exposure without paying exorbitant fees for management, the broker has found himself almost questioning on a daily basis, who am I here to serve? And that's why I think the model is unsustainable at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, as an, and I was a broker for 10 years, so I'm, I'm not, yeah, you, I'm not you come from preaching the heart anything that I haven't yeah. practiced. I yeah. learned all this the, the hard way, believe yeah. me. Yeah. The frustration is born of, so I, I think at the end of the day, what the advisor is doing versus what the broker is doing is the advisor is saying, look, I'm on your side of the table. I only get paid based on the assets I manage. I don't get paid by a mutual fund company to sell you something. I don't get paid per transaction, so I'm not incentivized to churn your account. Uh, I only get paid by you, so I have to do as good a job for you as possible. And I think that that's kind of the future and that's where things are going. And the brokers are gradually realizing that. A lot of these guys are now hybrids. They're part advisor, part broker. I think they'll make a wholesale shift to advisory in the next five years. Hmm. The data says that it's happening pretty quickly. Yeah. Now, in your own case, working on Wall Street was a dream of yours growing up as a kid. Yeah. You finally make it there. You get involved in the brokerage business. Yeah. And at what point all of a sudden you start thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm not really sure if what I'm doing here is ethical. You know, I, I like to think that I'm a smart guy, but it really took me a long time to wake up. Hmm. It, it's not the ethics, because I, I tried hard and everything I did, I had the right intentions. Mm -hmm. and. You know, I have an unblemished record, no complaints, no problems with regulators. But it just occurred to me in 2008, it was really, it really was crystallized. There was a wholesale market meltdown, and the smartest thing you could do if you were managing money was to just put your clients in cash and sit back and see what develops. Because right. you talk about unprecedented, Bear Stearns, yeah, Lehman, totally. AIG, yeah. there's no, so you the problem is, capital. as a broker, yeah. if you do that, you're going to take your kids to the soup kitchen yeah. because you're not getting not paid any, to, any money. to sit in cash. Yeah. So we had analysts who were picking stocks into this maelstrom. Mm -hmm. and guys come out in front of the boardroom of brokers and say, you know, you should buy these stocks for your clients today because they'll probably get killed less than those stocks. And I said to myself, you know, this model is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I, I, even if I do my best, I, I can't do the right thing by people. Yeah. And so at that point, I knew it was time to make a switch. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, I, I want to move over to the scripts that brokers use. Yeah. That y you basically, uh, you pulled the uh, the veneer off this and to, to show all the, uh, yeah. the fact that all these guys use it no matter where they are in the country. And yeah. if you're a wealthy person pretty much anywhere in Canada or the, or the United you've States, gotten this you've pitch. probably heard it. Without a doubt, yeah. Might, maybe even from me. Yeah. So I published this thing, for the. it's never been published before, mm -hmm. but it's kind of this, this Dead Sea Scrolls of, of brokerage sales forces. This thing has been passed on generation after generation. It's sacred. It's going back to the 1960s. I yeah. mean, uh, and it worked for 35 years or so. The problem is people don't answer their phones anymore. Everything is email, text messages, mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's cell phones, quick conversations. Mm -hmm. So this has stopped working. I talk to brokers that are still trying to do, yeah. you know, get someone on the phone and 
pound them until they give them an order on yeah. a stock. Yeah. It's not working anymore. Guys could dial all day long and not yeah. get a single guy to pick up the phone. Yeah. Um, so, but I published this thing for the first time. And if you're a high net worth individual with a working phone, you've probably heard it before. And if you read it, you'll say, I remember when a guy said that to me. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty widespread thing and no one's ever really put it in print and said this is how it works. Yeah, so yeah. that part of the book was actually really exciting to And do. because literally, let's take it a step further. I mean, you have the script, but you also have, if they say, you know, A, you answer with B. Yeah, I mean, you take it down. Rebuttals to objections. Exactly. So let me, you know, because the prospect gets a guy on the phone and it's a really exciting story, but, you know, nobody wants to be an impulse buyer. Mm -hmm. So the, the initial, it's like walking into a department store. Even if you need a salesperson's help, the minute a salesperson comes over and says, sir, can I help you? There's, you almost cringe. There's a reflexive yeah. kind of hesitation. And so brokers are trained to accept the fact that that's going to happen on the phone. And you got to get past that. So let me talk to my wife. Why don't you send me information? I don't mm -hmm. know about your firm. Let mm -hmm. me think about it. Um, let me check my finance. You know, mm -hmm. there's a whole host of excuses. And the brokers are trained in the art of turning those around into closes. Mm -hmm. um, so I put, a, I put all those in there in print as well. Uh, and, and again, these things still work to some extent once people get on the phone. Um, so I try to make it clear that nobody should be taking these calls. You also say in the book that you think mutual funds are going to disappear at some point within the yeah. next decade. Yeah, I don't, well, disappear is harsh. I think they're going to turn into ETFs. Mm -hmm. I think what, I think it's the wrapper. It's not, active management is not going to go away, mm -hmm. okay? I think what will change is the wrapper because the mutual funds got a lot of disadvantages. You have to understand, mutual funds, we're talking about the latest in 1930s technology mm -hmm. or, or, the, or the 1940 Investment Company Act. Sure. It, they've not been updated, so you've got to wait till the end of the day for liquidity and, and pricing. Uh, you've got these NAV issues. You've got the opacity. I think that's all going to migrate. And as proof of that, the largest mutual fund in the world, which is PIMCO Total Return, mm -hmm. it's a $300 billion fund, has also been recreated uh, two months ago as an active ETF. Hmm. So now you've got two they versions of They see the writing that. on the wall. So, yeah. I mean, they're not doing, right, they're doing that because they know that the broker sold mutual fund is dying mm -hmm. and the advisor recommended ETF is the new thing. Yeah. So I think you're gonna see a lot more of that. Yeah, now, what sort of reaction have you had from your peer group? From brokers you've worked with, you know, are you persona non grata now? Or are you recognized as a star? What kind of reaction are you Every getting? Every once in a while, I'll bump into someone who knows my shtick, and they, they're kind of like, you know, I hate that guy. But <laughs> it's not often. And most of the feedback I've gotten, especially from guys in the, listen, it's not easy being a broker. It's not easy being a salesperson of financial products in this day and age. It was much easier prior to the internet. Mm -hmm. But now the consumers are smarter or they have other access options to the market. Yeah. So these guys are unhappy themselves. We're in year 12 of a secular bear market. So the brokers are frustrated. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is speaking directly to them, mm -hmm. even more so than just to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So I think the reaction has really been, you know, I'm, I'm glad you said that, or it was nice to read that and know that someone else is thinking that way. Mm -hmm. So I think I have a lot of fans in the industry, even though There's what I'm saying There's some grudging respect. Yeah, I think a lot of them wish they had the ability to say these things. But yeah. when you work at a wirehouse firm, you work in a walled garden with yeah. prison wardens, and it's it's ironic, the, the firms, the three lead underwriters that brought Facebook public, their brokers aren't allowed to access Facebook and they're off, I mean, it's like a joke already. Wow. So I, I think there's a lot of pent up frustration and they were glad to see one of their own come out and say these things. Hmm. Um, so I'm not wearing a bulletproof vest when I walk around Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So far, I've, you know, I've gotten a really good You've reaction. Yeah. yeah. Now, you think you would have made more money if you would have stayed a broker and not written the book? No. No. I had, real, I had a lot of trouble making money in the last couple of years as a broker because I had woken up and I stopped doing the things that I recognized as counterproductive to my clients. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it, it's tough to go home to your wife and, you know, how much did you make this month? Why is it so much lower than this time last year? Mm -hmm. And you have to explain, look, I could have made quadruple that, but I just can't stomach recommending a private placement or mm -hmm. you know shoving everyone into a mutual fund on the last day of the pay period mm -hmm. I, just, I can't morally I can't handle it I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown yeah so having that conversation over the course of the year and then eventually you realize hey this ain't getting better mm -hmm. this is getting worse mm -hmm. I grew either I grew a conscience or I woke up or whatever but this ain't gonna change this is a flawed model mm -hmm. and I can't do it profitably anymore and look at myself in the mirror so 
you know, I, I guess that's really the best way to phrase it. So, no, I could not have made more money staying as a broker. I was really headed down a road to ruin mm -hmm. if I didn't take my clients out of there yeah. and make a big change. Yeah. So the pivot over to what you're doing now, walk me through what you're doing now. So now we're a fee only, not a fee based. Mm -hmm. We are a fee only advisor. We don't get paid to buy and sell things for people. We don't get paid selling concessions or, or commissions for trades. We really only get paid by the client. And so we're sitting on the same side of the table. Mm -hmm. And it's night and day. My it mentality sure when I go to work every day is not, hey man, how can I find three guys that'll do a trade with me? It's mm -hmm. not, it's, now it's just about performing mm -hmm. or, or keeping people out of harm's way, main pres uh, preserving people's capital, watching out for them, keeping abreast of the trends and taxation issues. And that's, to me, what I should have been doing all this time. And it, you know, when it's good, and, and w when you know you're doing right and you're getting good feedback from your clients and you know you're not screwing anyone over or making mistakes, it feels like flying. It's like all the weight's been lifted. And it, not that it's easy. These markets are nearly impossible yeah. for some of the smartest people in the world. Yeah. So I, I don't want to give the impression that it's easy, but it's gratifying yeah. and it's a really good feeling and the feedback from clients is great. And, you know, I look back on the other stuff I did I had a real chip on my shoulder about it and a lot of regret. Now I look back on it as I had to learn all the wrong things to do in order to know the right things to do. I, I, it was a trial that I had to go through and that's, I guess, the silver lining. Hmm. Well, listen, you have a great story and it, it's, it's, a, it's a story of redemption in many ways. It is. And uh, I appreciate you coming here and sharing it with Thank us Thank you today. so much. So, appreciate your time.